The Unshackled Waves, episode 231. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have you company. Well, it's finally on, the speculation has ended and the Australian federal election will be on Saturday the 18th of May 2019. The Morrison government is still behind in the polls, but with the gap now on average of 48-52 two-party prefer to Labor, many commentators are considering it game on. Of course, the election will not just be about the major parties, minor parties could prove to have a very big say in the next Senate. The Unshackled will be here to cover the election every step of the way, culminating, as always, with with an election night live stream, which this time will be an Uncuckables production, so stay tuned. In other news, it's been a week of high profile clashes with the powers that be. Uh, Julian Assange has been arrested at the Ecuadorian embassy in London and will be extradited to the US to face hacking charges. Avi Yemeni was deported uh, from the United States after he traveled there intending to confront TV host Jim Jeffries after his uh, recent TV show appearance with him. In Australia, rugby player Israel Folau looks set to lose his playing contract after posting a list of sinners who are destined for hell unless they turn to Jesus on his Instagram. And Neil Erickson was again detained by Victoria Police for interrupting Friday Islamic prayers in the Melbourne CBD. To discuss all this, I am joined by the senior editor of The Unshackled, Damien Ferry. Damien, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Tim. Now, there was speculation all week when the election was going to be called. We thought it was going to be called last weekend, uh, but then Scott Morrison ended up not calling it. Well, that's what the, the media ended up concluding. And then uh, Wednesday night, we heard that he was on his way to Canberra uh, to see the Governor General. All the, the news cameras were fixated on the, the Comcar one. And then Thursday, it was, it was finally on, and we're going to the polls Saturday May 18th. Yeah, it's um, going to be really interesting. I mean, we've got a, um, a big campaign ahead of us, obviously one that goes for more than a month. So um, there's going to be um, a lot of spin in that time. There's going to be a lot of lies said, <laughs> um, usual manipulation. Um, but it'll obviously be interesting to, I, I reckon it's going to be, it's going to be a very tiring sort of campaign once it gets down, down to it uh, towards the end. I mean, a lot of people are going to get sick of it eventually. Um, we're already seeing the, you know, some TV ads roll down on the on the media. Um, every now and then, we're seeing po things pop up. I mean, Clive, of course, he's been running them for months now, but um, the Labor and Liberal ads are just starting. And um, it, yeah, you know, it'll ju just be interesting to see how it all plays out, really. Well, you're in New South Wales, so you've just had a state election, and after the the dust has settled on that, well, we still don't know the makeup of the the upper house, and now there's a federal election on, so it's been pretty busy in New South Wales. It has, and um, I think New South Wales, at least uh, for the government, is going to be a pretty safe state for them. Um, I don't think it's be something where they're um, they're going to lose a lot of seats. Um, for instance. Um, uh, Victoria might be a different story for them there, but I think New South Wales will, will play out very similar to the state election. I think they'll um, either remain um, seats being exactly the same as, as it is now, or they might even pick one or two up, just depending on the circumstances. But um, yeah, I, I don't think it'll go too bad here in New South Wales for the government. Now, every election federally, it's always up to the Prime Minister's discretion. We have uh, three-year terms, uh, so it sort of seems that uh, after uh, we're always in election mode federally, but every state and territory now now has fixed four-year terms when we know when the election's going to be. And so we're, we're not waiting for the, the leader to, to visit the, the governor to, to sign the, the writs. And I, I think it's worth having the conversation about fixed uh, four-year terms federally, just given whether we're in election mode all the time. And you also have to remember that elections are expensive. Uh, it, it's, the Electoral Commission has to employ all the all the staff. Uh, probably the most difficult thing about getting fixed four-year terms would be eight-year terms for the Senate. Yeah, that's true. I mean, um, it's definitely something that we could speak about. A lot of people support four-year fixed terms. 
Um, I, I kind of like it as it is now because it gives that, um, I, I guess, that suspense feeling when it comes to election time that you don't know when it's going to come around and you, you're always looking out for it. And it gives that uh, a little bit of an edge to a, a government and, and a prime minister exactly to, to choose when, when he wants to call it. So, I mean, I don't mind it. I, I actually, I mean, I love elections so much. So, I mean, the, the, the more the more times it happens or that it occurs, the, the better for me. Oh, I'd love to have them every year. I mean, I just I just enjoy the whole election campaigning. And I think the, the, the more that we get to uh, have our leaders be um, called up to account and to have them um, consistently going through this, um, the better. Because when, when you have a four-year term, the thing is that, the, the politicians can do so much damage in their first year at, uh, at, at, of government that by the fourth year that people are going to forget what happened, you know. So that, that, that's one thing that you have to look at really when it comes to that. I, I think people don't have a really good memory. And, uh, you know, to have them a little bit more, more consistently and, and more often wouldn't be a bad thing for me. And I just love them, like I said. So uh, it's not something that I'm complaining about. And we're going to get polls galores in the next uh, five weeks. And I did a, a poll crunch uh, at the end of last week, and they're all roughly so. There's there's news poll, uh, which is considered the most authoritative. Uh, there's Galaxy. Both of those polls are in the the News Corp papers. Uh, then there is the Ipsos poll, which is in Fairfax. Uh, then there's the the Guardian Essential poll. Even though that's a left wing poll, I consider that probably one of the most reliable ones. And then you have the Morgan poll, which I don't take seriously much. And then there's the Seven Reach Chow poll, which we haven't um, heard from yet. Uh, most of the poll averages have it as 48 Coalition, 52 Labor. And we've just had a news poll uh, drop uh, right as we're recording, which shows that it's uh, 48, 52 in Labor's favor again. So that seems to be the the average. It's given the, the Coalition a a bit of confidence that they're in with a chance that they can make up uh, a four-point gap. I think anything can happen in this election. I mean, when it comes to polls, I think the polls have got to tighten over time. When it comes closer to election day, I think we're going to get really close to the 50-50. It's going to be very, very tight. Um, I mean, I don't really see a big mood for change in this election. I just don't see it. I, I don't see absolute hate for the government. And, of course, Bill Shorten, I mean, he's not a really popular leader, even amongst Labor voters. So that's going to work against him. Mm. So in saying that, I, I think it's, I mean, I, I'm really I'm really thinking that ScoMo might be able to pull off a 1993 here. I mean, I don't think he's going to get, you know, an overwhelming victory, but he might just scrape it. He might just scrape back in um, because of the unpopularity of Shorten. And um, obviously, at the same time, um, with the government policies in place, obviously the surplus issue that's going to be coming in very shortly, uh, national security and, um, you know, economic matters such as the taxes that um, they, they're going to be, you know, hammering labour on. Um, I mean, when you put all these issues together, it, it's going to be very, very difficult to see um, an overwhelming labour victory. I, I just, I, I feel that they're, things aren't going as bad as people make it out for the government. So it'll be interesting to see. In New South Wales, it's looking like the, the coalition will hold and it's looking good for them in regional Queensland. But the problem is because the state by state, this is such a different election. For example, in Victoria, my home state, the, the baseball bats are out for the, the coalition and they're looking at a loss of around seven or eight seats where even uh, ministers such as Greg Hunt, Alan Tudge and longtime backbencher uh, Kevin Andrews, they could all possibly possibly lose their seats, which are one uh, safe Liberal seats. And if they, they lose all those seats yeah, in Victoria, Victoria yeah. it's game over. Yeah. Well, Victoria isn't looking good for them, that's for sure. But I think the only way they can counter this is if they hold New South Wales as is, and they might pick up in Queensland, especially on the Adani issue. If they really campaign on the Adani issue and tell everybody up there, because you've got you to understand that, that Labor have a fair few seats around Townsville and up in that northern Queensland pocket. So they can definitely, the government can pick up seats here. And if they really um, push this anti-green agenda and this pro-job agenda, 
then I, I think they can do something there, you know? I mean, th this is where they can counter it. If, if they can do well in other states and just basically uh, concede that they are going to do poorly in Victoria, um, they might be able to weigh it out. It's, it's going to be interesting how it all plays and obviously um, how minor party, um, how, how the minor party vote um, when it comes to uh, preferencing, how that ends up um, filtering out to the majors. That's going to play a lot of part two when it comes to a lot of the, um, like you've got the shooters, the One Nations, all these little minor parties and just how people um, are obviously going to be preferencing. It's going to be very important and crucial in a lot of these seats. Not so much in Victoria because Victoria, we're, we're obviously, it's a, it's a very much very left-wing state. They're going to um, definitely do poorly. They're the Liberals. But in the other states, they might be able to make some gains and, um, and really hammer Labor because Labor are really pushing a climate change agenda in this election. They've already made a debacle of this electric car issue. I think that's going to be... I mean, I was actually telling people that the electric car issue could be the, um, the Houston, um, you know, tax on the cake moment for Labor in this election, you know. I mean, if they really go hard on this, I mean, they, the, the Liberals might pull something off here because the Labor Party haven't really been able to um, describe um, at all what they're, what they're actually talking about here. I mean, they've been very, very general and they've come out with all these ambitions and they haven't actually provided um, examples as to how they're going to get these targets that they're after, whether it be on the climate change targets, whether um, it'll be on the electric car targets. I mean, to go from uh, electric cars being 0.2% right now to all of a sudden 50%, like, you know, in 10 years' time, I mean, I, I just don't see that happening. I think that's crazy. And um, it really should be made a laughing, a laughing stock for Labor, really. I mean, you know, um, the Liberals just have to play their cards here. Well, the coalition is certainly hoping that the electric car issue is a birthday cake moment. So that's a, a expression that's ingrained in a, in Australian politics, or have a a daily uh, meltdown in the final week, as as Michael Daly uh, had with both his Asian comments and his uh, debate. Uh, performance and yeah Michaela Cash uh, she was probably the strongest saying that uh, uh, Bill Shorten's going to take away tradies utes and it, the thing is though Bill Shorten he thinks that his trump card is wages and the fact that real wages are, are not going up and fairness is is it's a it's a word that in Australia, it's like a fair go. So it cuts through. And so Bill Shorten's been running hard on that. And that's why he's spending all these times with, with families and homes saying, oh, how are you doing? Have, have you uh, had any increase in, in living standards? That's what he's banking on. That's what Labor's banking on, that share more of the, the pie. Well, the word fairness, I mean... <laughs> It's a very generalised term. I mean, fair for whom exactly? I mean, it's always going to be fair for someone and everyone's going to lose, lose out on the other end. I mean, um, not everybody can win in politics. I mean, when you're making promises, it always benefits someone, it always affects someone else. So that's why you have to keep it very balanced. And um, the Labor Party might definitely um, appeal to, to some people, a lot of young people that um, are definitely, you know, into into the issues of climate change, the environmentalism, um, and also wages and that, that's fair enough. But then you're also going to um, have a bad effect on small businesses that obviously are going to do it more tough. And I'm not talking big corporations, I'm talking businesses that are just scraping through now and that are struggling. We're also going to have um, uh, retirees, you know, people that have investment properties, you know, that um, uh, are obviously going to see things turn with Labor Party going in. So it always, you know, there's always issues here that it's going to benefit someone and it's not going to benefit someone else. And, and that's why it's going to be interesting how the electorate reacts. Because one thing you have to understand is that the Labor Party are really catering to people that will generally vote Labor anyway, right? Whereas the people that they have to try and bring across to their, um, to their cause, um, they're going to be turning them off. And that's why they might then shift their support to the Liberals, the undecided. I mean, you know, the whole um, issues on um, wages and on environmentalism, I mean, people that hold those kind of issues to heart and, and hold them as an importance would generally be Labor or, or Green supporters. So if you want to gain votes and, and, and you know, capitalise, you have to, you know, branch out 
and you know trying to track other people into into the fold and that's something that is going to be very difficult for them to do because of, of what they're running on here uh, i disagree with that because uh where the election is going to be held it's those it, it's the mortgage belt seats and so i think shorten's message of fairness is is probably going to it is cutting through more than scott morrison's uh, mm. economy and also wanting to keep your energy prices down that's that's just been the reality of politics for the past three years and it's not just uh, because the the liberal party they've also struggled on the energy issue because a lot of the the blue ribbon seats that you know have had prime ministers as members a lot of those mm. electorates have become gentrified and is full of a lot of wealthy people who care about issues such as climate change and other social justice causes that's why you have uh people uh, uh, people like um uh, Josh Frydenberg under under challenge from uh, Liberal Independent Oliver Yates and Julian Burnside with the Greens and uh, Tony Abbott in Warringah by Independent uh, Zali Segal and of course uh, Wentworth was lost to uh, Karen Phelps. Now it's sort of been said that well you know these aren't real Australia but the thing is they were the seats the Liberal Party relied on most to produce their uh, future leaders. That's true but at the same time the 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 party has to be consistent in their message. I mean, we've heard too often that they preach something in the cities and then they preach something else in the in the country. And the Labor Party is uh, guilty of that as well. I mean, they do. Yeah, the but I, I, my point is both yeah. both parties do that. Uh, the uh, Liberals yeah, have to do that. Labor have to do that. The only party that doesn't really have to do that is the National Party. Well, that, that's true. I mean. The thing is, though, I mean, it's very evident to voters when you're when you're doing that. I mean, people will see that you're not consistent and you're just saying whatever suits the area that you're in what, what, and who you're talking to. And because of that, people aren't going to take you serious. They're going to say, well, OK, if these people get elected, are they going to be doing what they're saying to me or are they going to be doing what they're saying to the other guy that lives in the other area? You know, so it's very, you know, people don't know what they're voting for anymore. You know, like, I mean, you don't know, I mean, minor parties, you can actually look at them and say, OK, they stand for this. And that's why they're gaining ground, because, I mean, especially, for instance, the Nationals um, losing ground in the country areas because they're really being second fiddle to the Libs. And the Libs, um, you know, half of their party, at least, um, are, are becoming more greenish because of the areas that they're, they're in, like you mentioned, and obviously they have to try and sort of um, reflect their electorate. But in doing so, it's really changing, um, you know, the party in itself. And then you'll also have the disinfected people that would normally vote Liberal on the other side that then have to turn to minor parties because the Liberals aren't representing anymore. So this is the kind of the, the, the issue that you have here. I mean, we start to... Uh, really not not know what people stand for anymore uh inconsistencies and i mean like labor party haven't even been clean on adani you know i mean they're they're really i mean that, that's why the liberals can really uh, hammer them like, like like we've already mentioned here that the liberals are going to do poorly in the inner city um areas um they're all they're always going to start to have their vote decline and, and get replaced but if you continue to try and fight there then you're also going to lose um, your seats over in the in the bush in the regional areas. So I mean, you you got to really look at it as well. What areas here do we really need need to keep here? I mean, and and also what's true to our party agenda? Um, what best represents our values? You know, I mean, we can't really change who we are um, just because you know things are shifting within the electorate. Otherwise, you know, if tomorrow our electorate becomes green, I mean. You know, I mean, are you going to just, you know, turn green just for the sake of it? I mean, you might as well just, you know, quit, let a green represent the seat and just move on because you don't really want to be changing who you are just, even though you have to represent, I understand that. But, I mean, it, it's a massive shift happening here, you know. I mean, it's it, it's unbelievable, but th there has to be some sort of consistent message and people don't understand what these, what these parties stand for anymore. I mean, the Labor Party used to be a party for the workers, but now they've shifted green and with their green agenda, they're really against the, you know, um, the typical sort of, you know, old school working class voter. Um, and at the same time, the liberals, 
that used to stand for, you know, um, small businesses are doing the same thing. It looks like both parties are, are, uh, are moving down that aisle. And electorally, I don't think it's, it's really um, smart because you've only got a couple of seats really in the inner city areas that, um, uh, at least maybe on my, on my angle, what I'm seeing in New South Wales, Victoria, maybe you've got more. But then there's a lot more seats elsewhere in Australia, in this country, that um, is going to be in effect if they do shift the other way. So I think really there's more to lose um, outside of the city than there is inside the city on a broad scale. There's also been a, a few, uh, what would you call, scandals or trip-ups uh, during the campaign already. Uh, Peter Dutton got into trouble uh, for criticising his a, a Labour opponent, Ali France, for not living in the electorate and using a disability as, as an excuse. That was seen as insensitive, and so he's uh, eventually withdrawn that. And then uh, Melissa Park, who she was actually the Labour MP for for Fremantle previously, she was going to run as the, the Labour candidate in the seat of Curtin, which is safe liberal seat, Julie Bishop's uh, seat, uh, but she withdrew her candidacy because she was too critical of uh, Israel in a, in a speech that was leaked. And then three liberal candidates in Victoria running in safe Labour seats, they all withdrawn because of a uh, dual citizenship, which given the, the last parliament, that's that's pretty embarrassing. It is. I mean, it's going to it's gonna be really um, funny to see what the replacements of these people are now. Um, with Dutton, look, I mean, he has a point. I mean, it can become, a, it, come, it comes across harsh. I understand that. But at the same time, people do have an expectation that the, the person that's running for a seat is a local. I mean, and even though someone was to have a disability, I, 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 like, like what he originally said, I mean, I, I don't understand exactly um, how that affects why that person couldn't have lived in that area. I mean, I'm sure that there is some services there that could cater for, for, for her. I mean, I, I understand it's harder. I understand that it's, um, you know, it's a bigger sort of, you know, there's more issues in play here. But, I mean, if this person is serious about running for a seat here, then they could have you know, well, I think they should have, you know, moved to the seat and, and, and remained a local. I think, you know, spared this criticism here. And even though it might be seen as harsh, it, it is correct what he's saying, you know. Yeah, and uh, it's definitely given uh, his opponents, who are not just Labour in that seat, but also a uh, get-up. They've been uh, very active in this campaign. They're trying to get rid of Peter Dutton up there in Dixon. He's only on a margin of around 2%. And Tony Abbott in Warringah, they're supporting indirectly as they can, Zali Stegall, the uh, liberal independent, alleged liberal independent. But there's also been a few uh, conservatives attempt to take on Get Up. In, up in Queensland, there's this group that's been around for a while, Right On. Uh, they uh, participated in the, the Queensland uh, state election. Uh, they, they've got an anti-Get Up slogan, uh, Get Out. And there's also this uh, new group, Advance Australia, backed by some uh, Australian conservative businessmen such as Sam Kennard, Maurice Newman and uh, David Adler. And apparently their members and supporters were wanted more accountability of third parties in elections, which ironically enough is themselves, uh, but their supporters meant get up. And so they've created uh, this character, Captain Get Up, who's going to reveal all the, the secret ways Get Up gets foreign money from overseas to support mm -hmm. progressive causes. And I have to say, it's it's really lame and cringe and pretty much sums up why the conservative activist movement has failed over the past 15 years or forever since when Get Up started in 2007. Yeah, well, when, when I'm watching something like it, I mean, it kind of reminds me of um, when we used to be in school, like in the 90s, and they used to have like a really old sort of, you know, um, a tape, like a really sort of, you know, cheesy sort of corny tape of like, um, you know, whether it be in PE class or something. Uh, you know, Harold, the life education yeah. bus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although I'm a fan of Harold, though. I, I was a fan of that. But I'm, I'm just saying in general, like when you're watching one of those, you know, old videos and stuff and it just comes across really sort of, you know, corny and stuff. But they, and, and I mean, really, the, the whole 
the whole idea behind it, and it's like some, you know, high school students just got together and, um, you know, wrote something really, you know, childish like this. I mean, what they should have done was they could have really started a campaign, um, you know, whether it be TV commercials or pamphlets or whatever they decided to do, and really hammered, um, even if they wanted to focus on get up some, um, you know, foreign money and that, they could have done that. But the whole cartoon character, you know, Captain Get Up and stuff, I thought that was ridiculous. So... Uh, and I mean, they should be really propping themselves up as um, as their own entity in itself, and really trying to boost their name up of Advance Australia, and um, you know, getting followings. You know, and and I mean, it's going to be difficult when it comes to get up. Like we we know that corporations are behind it. Um, you know, people from overseas, and that's what's difficult. I mean, the conservative side of politics. Um, naturally, I mean, it doesn't cater to, um, you know, all the corporate heavyweights. People, um, you know, with either nationalistic or conservative views aren't going to be, um, you know, doing um, anything of benefit for these people, you know, in the, in the upper, upper end of town. So generally, it's going to be harder to get money and therefore be able to increase your profile and, and build and, and become something, you know. And, um, so, you know, organisations like GetUp do it really easily because they're, they're they're catering to that crowd that you know have the money. Yeah, I mean, GetUp. Uh, we both don't like GetUp, but you have to give them credit. They're good at what they do, not just at getting money, but also getting manpower as well. Or should I say, people power? Uh, that's how GetUp would would like me to call it. But they're they're out there in Waringa, door knocking every uh, house in the electorate, and th this is what uh, annoys me about the conservatives. They they're so butthurt about how good GetUp is, and they they basically, if they could, they would ban and get up rather than right. actually get good at activism themselves and this is what's so terrible about what advanced australia have done they're defining themselves on their opponent that we're the the anti-get up rather than campaigning on conservative issues uh engaging right. grassroots you know really like investing in like a ground game infrastructure that's what you've got to do in campaigns that's what get up and all of the left-wing groups do really well they've got great infrastructure instead you you know you're carrying on obsessed with your opponents and ba basically the mm -hmm. you know the, the reaction from get up and like the left on social media has just been my god how lame is this haha <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's right they've been laughing at us i mean you know really it's uh and i don't i can't blame them you know i mean they they, they have everything going for them they're, they're, they're pumping it out they're really you know working hard like you said i mean you can't criticize their effort and I mean, rather than, you know, um, trying to just, you know, do an anti-get-up campaign, we should look at what they're doing and try and, you know, mimic their, their work ethic, you know, they're doing and say, okay, this is what we need to do. We need to get out there, talk to people, put our, you know, our, pol uh, our, our, our platform out there for people to see, try and create a, what, something get-up is good at. Um, regardless of, you know, them having their connections with, you know, Labor and Greens and stuff, is that they've they've basically um, built up this positive sort of uh, activist image where they've been able to gain a lot of um, people's support just based on, you know, what their core beliefs are, you know, because, and I mean, obviously it helps that their beliefs are pushed in the media and stuff. I mean, of course, you know, that, that helps them, whereas ours are always, you know, tarnished and criticised. But despite that, I mean, what we should be focusing on is, OK, um, you know, Events Australia want to, you know, make sure that Australia Day doesn't change, you know, so they could go ahead with a patriotic message. They could push, you know, um, you know, simple, you know, freedom of speech, you know, um, the whole, you know, um, um, you know, anti sort of nanny state kind of um, position, um, you know, um, you know, the problems with our immigration system. I mean, there's so many, you know, crime, there's so many things that they can, you, you know, speak about and, you know, get out and start to, to build this kind of, so that way when people hear Advance Australia, they know who they are. You know, everybody knows who Get Up is. They've been able to, you know, build their name up and it's taken over 10 years, like you've said. And Advance Australia, it's going to take, you know, over a decade for them to do the same if they do it right. You know, they have to do it right. They have to learn by example. They have to see what it's worked in the past and what hasn't. And they have to go with that, you know. We've used their, their policy or their, their, their platform, so to speak, and just, you know, try and do what others have successfully done in the past for your own cause. That's how it's going to work, you know. 
And probably another progressive third party, or not organization, but person in this campaign is Alex Turnbull, Malcolm Turnbull's son. Now, he's been uh, <laughs> pumping out uh, uh, plenty of bile on Twitter uh, against uh, conservatives, but he's also helping out a lot of these liberal independents. Uh, uh, Julia Banks, who is probably the most vengeful of these ex-liberals, she's running in Flinders against Greg Hunt. She confess that uh, she spoken to Alex Turnbull and he's helping her gain finance for, for his uh, campaign and it's it's his uh, connection to his father is sort of dismissed by well like uh, a son can be different from his father but given that you know Malcolm Turnbull's uh, politics, uh, they're, they're pretty in line with his son and like it's, it seems that Malcolm Turnbull, all of his rage, spite, vengeance has been channeled into his, his son and his son is the third party to uh, wreak havoc back on the Liberal Party. Yeah, that's what it, it looks like, that's for sure. I mean, it's, um, he's, um, well, well, Turnbull actually, I think it was pathetic that he came out recently and, you know, had a dig at Dutton and then, you know. Oh, yeah, was that was so overreach. <laughs> I mean, if, if anybody had to, you know, actually um, analyse, um, you know, Turnbull's loyalty, I mean, that just said it right there. I mean, really, for him to come out and attack somebody within his own party, I mean, mm. who does that? You never see that happen at all. I've never seen that happen, you know? I mean, it's um, it's always been that they've come out and attacked the other side if they wanted to have a dig, but they've never dug at their own party. I mean, it, it's, it's ridiculous. And... Um, and then a bit him in the ass as well because he had the connections with the with the with the um, Chinese seller anyway. But um, yeah, you know Turnbull. I mean, everybody knows his son's position. I know that also in the past his um, his campaign for the Labor Party. I'm pretty sure he's had some um, uh, some connections with Labor as well. Um, you know, it's a it's an anti sort of conservative sort of uh, um, agenda. And I mean the. Unfortunately, the Liberal Party have allowed this to happen because, you know, the infiltration um, happened under their watch and, you know, they were able to take over and, and cause a lot of effect, you know. I mean, in New South Wales, they run the party, um, unfortunately, and there has been some attempts in other states to try and sort of push it the other way. But, you know, more and more that I see, you, you're seeing less conservative members, more sort of small L Liberal members um, get in. So... It, it, it's it's a you know you got to you got to give it to them you know they, they've they've played their cards right and they've actually um, achieved what they've set out to I mean it's not going to be something that we um, we're, we're enjoying seeing but I mean they've done uh, they've done something that uh, isn't illegal but uh, was very smart you know and, and this should send warning signals out there that maybe the Liberal Party isn't the party that uh, stands for for your values, you know? I mean, if, if they're doing this sort of uh, activity and they're shifting, then you have to shift your vote too. I mean, it's simple as that, you know? Let's move on to the, the high profile clashes that uh, various people have had with uh, the powers that be. And uh, probably the, the biggest development over the past few days, well, sort of at least in the the right-wing uh, nationalist patriot scene is Avi Yemeni being uh, detained and deported uh, from the United States. Now, the background to this is he uh, agreed to be interviewed by uh, Jim Jeffries, who I'd never heard of uh, and, and, until uh, this whole episode. Uh, the Jim Jeffries show is is on Comedy Central in the United States. Apparently he used to be Australian, but now he's an American. He is an alleged comedian. And so he interviewed Avi. Apparently Avi wasn't his first choice for an Australian patriot. He first wanted Blair Cottrell and Neil Erickson, uh, but Avi was the one that, that agreed to it about um, nationalism. And uh, this was conducted in, in Singapore, and Avi secretly recorded this. And I think this should be standard practice for, for any uh, 
person in our circle who talks to the mainstream media is secretly record whatever you say to them in case they they stitch you up and then you've got the recording there it doesn't have to be a hidden camera it can just be like just a voice memo on your on your iphone it's 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 easy to do therefore uh, you're protected and uh what rv recorded of jim jeffries i mean he shouldn't have confessed all these things that he did to rv he he drew a, a photo of muhammad himself jim jeffries and said oh i can edit it to make myself look really good and you don't tell someone like <laughs> rv that and of course when the show went to air it was recorded back at the beginning of the year uh before the christchurch massacre happened but it was put to air after and Arby tries to uh like distance himself as as much as he can from sort of the the national socialists like he always wears the jewish yarmulke in the interviews and they they put him um in the in the segment they they played a clip of uh, sherman burgess who is a confessed uh, national socialist and of course that got Arby riled up and so he released this uh <laughs> tape and uh he's he's uh been running with this ever since Arby. well you know i mean you make a good point there uh, i think it was really smart that he uh set that uh video recording up and it, it basically confirmed what we already knew which was that this is the sort of activities that um that whenever whenever you're involved in an interview i mean they're always going to cut and paste things make it look like you said something you haven't um, it's very smart because they're all pushing certain agendas here. I mean, you know, if uh, Jim Jeffries had previously asked uh, Blair and, um, and Neil to come on, I think they were smart not going on there and refusing because they knew what was going to happen, what was ahead here. But, you know, you know you've got to give it to Arby because at least he spun it his way and, you know, um, he accepted it. But also in saying that, he sort of had at the back of his mind that this sort of thing would happen. So he set him up and made him look a fool, you know, which you, you got to give it to him for that. Um, but every time you're going for an interview, this, this is what's, you know, going to take place. It's to be expected, you know. I mean, we're, um, this, this is the sort of uh, circumstances we're living in, unfortunately. Yeah, so following this, uh, Avi has got his his following. He he originally was quite active in the Melbourne Patriot scene, but he's spent he's spent a lot of time in the the UK now helping Tommy Robinson get his uh, TR dot news uh, venture up and helping uh, Tommy beat the the social media censors. Uh, so uh, this. Um, he, uh, what he's done with his his following both local and international is get them to go on Jim Jeffries pages and say you know you're a fraud and that and Comedy Central have been deleting all the uh, all the comments and because Avi you know loves this you know confrontation thing this is what's got him in trouble with Facebook because he's like gone and like confronted people who've like sent him like you know nasty things and that and uh, that always gets you in trouble in social media so he planned to go to the United States to confront Jim Jeffries at at Comedy Central, or when he arrived at LA Airport, he was with Sidney Watson, who he's mm. uh, teamed up with you know, with a few things uh, when he's been based here in Melbourne, and uh, they were uh, detained uh, first at, at customs, and then Avi was interrogated by the FBI, who said, who said we've like got these complaints from Comedy Central that you know you're planning to do some sort of terror operation uh sure. on him and of course like i have uh, like Arby was able to explain uh like you know he was just gonna you know have his mic and camera there and they're like oh yeah yeah um so the fbi were going to give him the all clear uh yeah. but customs and border patrol they they found that on his uh he applied to be on a, a visa waiver program, which allows Australians to get into the United States quite easily. But because he'd been denied a visa or entry uh, 15 years prior and didn't declare that, then uh, his visa application was null and void, which by the letter of the law, Arby should have been deported. And Arby said that he's going to apply for the the proper uh, visa, and if that's denied, then he's going to be saying that there's um, trickery going on. Yeah, then that's going to be very interesting to take note there as well, and also for future, um, if anybody was to, um, you know, want to want to achieve the sort of same thing as um, as he was doing there, just so people understand 
uh, what the law is and what you can and can't do, you know, get a bit of an idea because um, you don't want to be in a situation like that where um, you're going over there with good intentions and then all of a sudden you're going to be, you know, having... So uh, it's best to do your research and make sure what, what, what everything is, you know, like um, and what you're going to get yourself into. And I noticed that a lot of the uh, left uh, Antifa types are bragging on social media saying, ha ha RV, you, you were in, you're in favour of strong borders, yet you were denied entry because a country has uh, strong borders. And mm. uh, a lot of people are also pointing out, oh, you are the type of people who cheered uh, Yasmin abdel uh being denied entry to the United States, but now you're all um, butthurt that RV is... Uh, being denied, which I think is a, a is a fair. Or Yasmin was denied because she had the wrong visa, and Avi mm -hmm. was denied because uh, there was there was not the right information on his visa application. So it's fair to say, like oh, the, the the two of them, they're sort of similar, mm -hmm. and it's sort of a legitimate point that if if somebody on our side falls foul of like these sort of not following the rules, we all jump to conspiracy. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you're right there. Pe people have to look at things fairly here. I mean, um, you, you can't just automatically jump to someone's side um, even when they're in the wrong, you know. You've got to call it out for what it is. Um, and th this is politics, unfortunately. You see it all the time, um, you know, um, someone from a particular side and um, there's, there's someone that um, is, a, is alleged to do something wrong and in their eyes, not. Nah, you know, this person can't do anything wrong, you know, and it's a shame, you know, you have to really look at it for what it is, regardless of what side you choose, um, both very similar circumstances and, yeah, you know, I mean, you, you can't have bias when it comes to these things. Yeah, well, we'll see when Avi reapplies for his visa to the United States, uh, what happens there and then we'll probably get a more accurate reading on what's going on but in the u.s uh, people have to understand like you know donald trump he doesn't get to like you know sign a bit of paper like stamp say approved uh, denied like that's not how it works in the u.s yeah that's right i mean it's a difficult process and people really have to be aware of um of all of the steps in place here and you know Try, try and make sure you do you do your uh, research properly, you get the paperwork filled in properly, and then you're not going to have any um, encounter any problems. Now, back here in uh, Melbourne, uh, Neil Erickson, one of Melbourne's uh, local patriot activists and uh, renowned uh, serial pests, as he's known, he did another one of his infamous street stunts. Uh, he went to uh, Friday Islamic prayers at Federation Square in Melbourne. Uh, he told us that he was... Uh, what he told us is that he was planning to ask the people there questions. He didn't tell us exactly what he was going to do, but just suggested we go there. So we did. And so he went there with a megaphone to, to uh, shout, uh, Muhammad is a false prophet. Uh, Muhammad was a terrorist. I vote for his running. And he was, uh, the Victoria police who were there, they dragged him down the steps at Federation Square and uh, uh, detained him on breach of the peace, he was there with his Cook's Convicts 2IC, Ricky Turner, who uh, gave it to the police and their point was how come the vegans were allowed to uh, block yeah. traffic for, for three hours, how come I'm not allowed to be in a public place having my uh, free uh, free speech, why are they allowed to pray, uh, pray in the street uh, when no other religion is afforded that right? I, I understand um, what the point he was trying to make here. I, I personally, I, I'm not a fan of that sort of um, thing because I don't think it really benefits our cause. I, I don't think mm. it really um, is productive. Um, but I do understand what, what point he was trying to make. I mean, the, the whole vegan situation was was chaotic. I, I can't believe that they got away with it the, the way they did, you know. I mean, it really, um, it, w it really was sad. And, and just, to, you know, to, to see how... how um, such a group like um, vegans, for instance, are, are treated a lot nicer than um, people that, you know, uh, supporters of free speech or, you know, that are patriotic or, or whatever other cause that, that's on the right. It's such a big difference here. I mean, what they did for, for hours, shutting down the traffic there. And um, 
uh, you, you just wouldn't believe it. I mean, it, and so many people were angry about that as well. You know, I mean, it's um, it's something that's been in the news for for many days, and obviously, even worse when they go out on the farms, you know, and they trespass and and go out on there and um, cause havoc. And they've gotten away with it for so long, and it's only now recently that um, the Liberal Party have come out and said that they're thinking of uh, bringing, well, if they get re-elected, um, that they would um, bring in laws to, um, you know, um, stop things like this from happening. I think it's a uh, one-year one year prison sentence or something like that. Yeah. Which, you know, I mean, in a way, I mean, I, I think it's fairly soft as is. I mean, when you're going on someone's property, I mean... <laughs> You know, you're, you're obviously intending to do harm. I mean, when you're going on there storming it with, you know, 100 activists, I mean, I, I just, you know, one year I think is, is, you know, a very lenient sentence, to be honest. I mean, mm. and unfortunately in this country, our farmers don't have any, any rights like in the US where they can defend themselves, you know. I mean, um, if, if all of a sudden things turned out sour and, you know, um, someone got hurt, then the farmer would be in deep shit, you know, whereas the, the vegan activists would then be looked as, uh, at as the victim, even though they're the ones that started the confrontation in the first place, because that's what they're there for. They're obviously there to get a reaction and to, you know, cause harm, because if they weren't, then, you know, they would just have their little meeting and, you know, in their, you know, hall down the road or whatever and, you know, have a, have a little bit of a discussion or amongst themselves, you know, go down the library, whatever they choose to do. But when you're going on someone's property, you're doing that. I mean, that, that's, that, that's even worse than in, being um, in public because it's on private property. It's even worse. So um, I understand what, what he was trying to do um, in, in, in trying to say that one one is accepted and one isn't. But nevertheless, you know, it's obviously two situations um, with the vegan one that weren't, they were, they, were, they were doing their own protest. They weren't actually, you know, um, protesting someone or, or a group that was already in that vicinity. It was a little bit of a different circumstances, but nonetheless, he made the point clear. Um, I just think that it, it makes our movement look uh, boganish, a little bit more, you know, unprofessional. I, I, I think this is the kind of um, image that people on the left want us to, uh, want us to to go down. It, it makes us look really, you know, like, um, yeah, it, it doesn't doesn't come across as in, in in any way professional, and I don't think it does um, a really good thing for our cause in when you look at it all up here. Yeah. I mean, Neil at his best is entertaining and satirical, but he does regularly cross the line. He crossed the line on this show recently, as we uh, found out. Uh, so he's certainly uh, polarizing. But yeah, mm. it's uh, it's a lot of the time that there's <laughs> a method to his madness. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand. I mean, he has his own his own methods, his own ways, and um, obviously he pays the price for that. You know, it's. It's a brave stunt to pull, and he does it, you know, quite often. But I, I just, my personal view is that I wouldn't go about it the same way. I think we have to really, um, you know, um, come across as um, as uh, people with legitimate uh, concerns about certain issues. I mean, it just makes us look bad, you know. It, it, it and it, it just, yeah, you know, it makes people, um, you know, on the media it gives them power, you know, it gives them uh, ammo. Because then they will put up, oh, you know, right-wing extremist, you know, comes and, you know, attacks, you know, the innocent people praying in the street, you know. I mean, this is the kind of image that, um, you know, they would love because it victimises the minority groups more and, and makes people um, like him out to be, you know, crooks and, and to be animals, savage, you know. Like, um, and if you really want to make an effect and a positive impact on society, it's obviously not the right way to go about it, but... Like you said, he obviously has his own ways, um, you know, the entertainment value, sure. I mean, but in general, I, I think we need to be uh, really, um, yeah, just, just really careful in how we present ourselves, I think. Well, probably the biggest international story of the week was uh, Julian Assange arrested at the, the Ecuadorian embassy where he in the London in the United Kingdom uh, where he'd been seeking asylum for the past seven years and everyone thought that this was coming because there'd been a change in the the Ecuadorian leadership the the new mm -hmm. president Lenin 
uh, Moreno wasn't a fan of Assange. And so this happened last Thursday evening. Uh, Assange, he, he, he gave it his best shot to resist. There was, there was that footage of him coming out of the, the embassy. And then we found out uh, very quickly that the UK authorities would be uh, handing him over to the, the US authorities uh, charged with uh, computer hacking, uh, which only carries a sentence of five years. Um, there's a lot of rumours circulating that there could be uh, more serious charges such as espionage, uh, which uh, could potentially seem get the the death penalty and now there's a few sort of um things that raise people's suspicions about this that there was a 4.2 billion dollar international monetary fund loan given to ecuador in the uh, immediately after his arrest and the the former president who granted him asylum rafael uh correa his uh, facebook page uh, was uh, deleted yeah, it's a, I mean, this story, uh, I think it's something that actually, it's one of the few issues that bring a lot of people, at least on the the the, the far right and the left together, I mean, when it comes to... Yeah, I, I, I agreed it's, with Richard Di Natale just this morning. Yeah, yeah it's, it seems to me that the, the, the people that are against him the most are your, your sort of, you know, typical neoliberal sort of shields, you know, um... But um, apart from that, you know, your, your people, your, your your people on um, either libertarian or you know the alt right circles, and then all and people on the left as well. This is this is one issue that they can agree with. And then you've got you know your your typical sort of you know centrist or you know liberal types that are the ones that are um, are really against him. You know, um, but this is what I mean these days. A lot of the time, it's um, it's establishment versus anti-establishment. It's not really a left or right issue a lot of the time. And this is one issue in particular that um is a perfect uh that, that you can you can tell is is like that uh i mean he's 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 been somebody that people have followed for a long time now he's uh it looks like he's aged about 50 years or whatever just you know with the beard that he's come out with his, his white beard lately um a lot of people have made comment on that that he looks really stressed and that you know he's I mean, he's been he's been there, you know, for for a long time now, you know, in the Ecuadorian embassy. I mean, it's it's not easy to you know be in hiding, so to speak, for for that long. And I mean, he's trying to well in his mind, he's, he's you know trying to do the right thing and uh, come out and uh, reveal all these all this hidden information that you know he believes people should be aware of. And at the same time, there's people trying to shut him down. I mean, we've seen this, you know. Um, even within social media circles recently, it's um, it's very common and it's very sad to see this that uh, we're not getting people um, to be able to um, feel like they can say things without um, a, a massive repercussion on what they say. At least you know um, getting shut down or even in his case, um, you know, charged for instance. Yeah, uh, even though he's been. Uh we're pretty pretty much restricted to that embassy for for seven years. WikiLeaks has still been uh, very active, uh, especially uh, most infamously during the the 2016 presidential elections, where it revealed the the Democratic National Committee emails, which showed that uh, Hillary Clinton's operatives rigged the primary uh, against uh, Bernie Sanders, and then there were the Podest John Podesta a campaign chief's uh, emails that uh, were released and sh showed the, the Clinton Foundation all of their uh, dodgy uh, dealings. And uh, candidate Trump at the time, he said, you know, I love WikiLeaks, I look forward to, uh, to, uh, to the leaks, and uh, there's a lot of suspicion that uh, his uh, one of his chief operatives, Trump, Roger Stone, was in uh, in communication with uh, Julian Assange. That's been denied by both parties. Uh, but now, it's uh, because Trump has appointed all these establishment deep state people in his presidency, they're, because they're all hardcore neocons, they've been determined to get Assange. There's been this secret grand jury uh, going on uh, to indict him and have thrown Chelsea Manning back in jail for refusing to testify against Assange. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has been leading this charge to, to extradite Assange and now Trump's saying, oh, I don't really know much about Assange, mm -hmm. basically cucking out. And I think this is the biggest challenge of Trump's presidency. 
uh, is he going to protect somebody who who basically exposed the the evils of the deep state, the political establishment, mm, all that he mm. campaigned against, or is he going to cuck and just let the the deep state have have him as you know to do what they please to uh, to to make an example of? If Trump allows that, then in my opinion, there's no point of the Trump presidency. It's it's all for nothing. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems it seems like um, the old saying that when things are too good to be true, sometimes I mean. Every time we, um, well, it's been like this for a while now that, oh, yeah, this, this person is our guy now. He's our guy. And then, um, you know, slowly, slowly, oh, yeah, it didn't, no, that didn't work out, you know. And then the next person comes up, oh, yeah, it looks like this person is the one now. You know, everyone's looking for some sort of, um, some sort of saviour, a politician, you know, um, to try get rid of this deep, the deep state influence. But I think it's something that's always going to be there. I, I don't think it's possible, you know. I mean, I think the, the best thing that Trump's ever done was that he was able to um, build up this movement, even though he wasn't um, exactly, um, you know, a perfect candidate because of these flaws. But nevertheless, people um, were able to rise up um, in support of his presidency because of a lot of the issues he was speaking about. And even when he has now um, had these operatives within his presidency and has, has turned, that movement is still there strong and building. So he has really, even though he has, um, even if you, if you were to say he was a seller, it wouldn't really matter in the grand scheme of things because it has done a lot of um, difference within the, the populace and then the, the, the impact it's had on society. Um, I, I think that's a greater um, a greater objective that's been achieved here. Um, but it is a shame, of course, you know, and I, I think it was terrible when he came out and he's like, oh, no, no, I don't know nothing. I don't know who he is. You know, I mean, it's obvious lies because we've seen the video, cl uh, video clips um, previously of him saying how good he was. I mean, and this just basically makes him out to be any other old politician. It, it doesn't help his... Um, his character, that people were defining him as this person that was not politically correct, that came out and said it how it is and all the rest of it. And the only good thing, like I've said, is that it's actually made other people in society like that. So even though when he has turned now, people have still stayed true to their um, to their principles that uh, they were um, they were given years ago. The, within the last couple of years, this whole sort of uh, building of the alt-right movement and all of that, I mean, this has been massive. And um, where his presidency started was where it all started, you know. I mean, and even if his presidency, you know, ends tomorrow, I mean, the movement is still, you know, it's that's where it's come from, you know, and it's only building over time. So I've had, I have a lot of respect because of that. Um, but I think it's it's very slack of him to to act this way. I um I was yeah, it was a real shame when I when I heard that. Yeah, I agree that uh, w there wouldn't be an alt right nationalist movement in the the United States without Donald Trump. I recently saw an article in my news feed that said that 24 million Americans have alt right views, which is an insanely high figure. But the reality is, Trump is now supported by. A st a mainstream Republicans. I mean, he has an approval rating amongst registered Republicans around 80%. And so even though they're all never Trumpers during his uh, campaign, they're, they're all uh, Trum uh, Trumpet years now. And I posted this on uh, my personal Facebook. Like, can you imagine that what you know what it's going to say if Julian Assange is jailed under his presidency, yet Hillary Clinton is still walking free? Mm -hmm. I think that was something like that would be huge. But I think this is what the neocons do. I mean, that would be a point. Um, for, for them to do something like that would be a very big ego boost for them because they would basically be saying and warning up just when you thought you had somebody, we're the ones that are in control here. You know what I mean? This is this is the, the message they want out there. I mean, if, totally 360 degrees in what he used to talk about and say and what, what he does now then they can do that to anybody. You know, they, they're trying to scare people from coming out and trying to be that candidate that's anti-establishment, you know, um, against glo globalist agendas and everything like that. And 
you know, they're doing a good job at it because a lot of people are becoming really black pilled lately. They're, they're really thinking, oh, you know, there's no hope for us now. You know, people are getting really negative all of a sudden because of what's happening with the social media crackdown, with, you know, people like Trump and other nationalist leaders that are going a little bit soft and that are, you know, starting to turn, playing hard on people's thoughts right now. And, you know, people just have to stay strong and, you know, when you believe in something, just continue to stand up for those beliefs, you know. I mean, um, don't, don't um, have money or anything buy you, buy you out and change your views because at the end of the day, um, you, you're never going to be remembered as someone of, um, uh, uh, to have any respect when, when, you, when you act like that in, in that behalf. I mean, but this, this is the message here, you know. If, if they were to turn someone like Trump, that would be a massive a massive dent in the, in, in, in the movement, you know. I mean, it would really put people back and basically, in a way, say, look, you know, you guys, you thought you had um, influence, you've got nothing. Now, Australia's best rugby player, Israel Folau, is set to have his contract uh, with R uh, Rugby Union Australia uh, terminated uh, because uh, he posted on his Instagram a list of uh, sinners who, who are going to hell. He listed uh, liars, adulterers, uh, fornicators, homosexuals, uh, atheists, uh, idolites, uh, only Jesus saves. And now he he gotten into trouble for an Instagram comment he'd made a year previously when he was asked what's God's plans for gays and he said hell unless they uh, repent and he'd, he'd gotten reprimanded by Rugby uh, Union Australia for, for that and he's uh, he's been undeterred by that and so has tweeted this again and uh, Rugby Australia have, have had enough and they said it's their intention to terminate uh, his contract. Uh, they did uh, they couldn't reach him initially after he made it uh, on the on the Wednesday night. They did eventually have a, a meeting, uh, sit down. Israel Folau, he has no regrets. He's he's not uh, backing down from his uh, religious uh, beliefs and convictions. Um, but it, it seems that it's yeah, it's too much for for the the rugby sport. Yeah, I mean it's a very sad sad moment here when you um, basically can't express any political opinions or any uh, social opinions for that matter um, without, you know, facing some sort of, um, you know, dismissal here um, in employment. I mean, it's um, with any other job here, you'd expect this to be a, um, an unfair dismissal case, surely. It's, a, it's quite, quite strange, I think, that especially him doing it in his own, um, you know, just on social media on his own personal page it wasn't that he went out publicly um you know out on the street and you know um did a neil erickson so to speak or anything like that i, I just um i just can't believe how you know rugby australia came to the conclusion that that somehow breached his contract you know well there's that's what the the debate has been uh can he sue for religious discrimination or breach of contract or has rugby australia have they written the contract in a way that if you bring the game into disrepute uh, by w whatever means then we have the right to terminate your, your contract there's a lot of legal experts at the moment we probably probably won't know uh, for a while now there's there's actually a conspiracy that Israel Folau did this on purpose because he he wanted to uh, sign up to play rugby union over in in France and had a contract line up over there and therefore he could get out of his contract by being a religious martyr. Well, that could be the case, but I mean, with bad publicity now, if if that were, if that were to happen, I mean the the. the the club over in France could always reject him now as well, you know, I mean, or it could cause a storm up there. Um, because, I mean, Europe at the moment isn't really, you know, a, a conservative's paradise that would, you know, like, I mean, they would be, you know, just as politically correct and everything as they are here. So, I mean, that, that, that's something that's interesting and it'll be, it'll, be, it'll be fair to tell what happens down the road. But I, I just think it's when people say that it brings the game in disrepute, um, that it somehow uh, tarnishes the image of the game or it's somehow, you know, that people, when they um, hear him make a remark like that, they, that, um, they picture him as, um, you know, the cornerstone or representative of, the, you know, 
that his views rep- I mean, his views don't represent the game because the game is just a sport. The, a sport shouldn't be political. It's got nothing to do, you know, with anything other than sport. So when people hear him say a comment like that, I just don't know, well, I don't understand why it's connected to the sport and that, you know, people make the case of, oh, because of his comment now, people are going to think that these are the views of Rugby Australia. I mean, how, how is that the case? I mean, it was a personal view on his own social media page. I mean, it's got nothing to do with the game. He didn't say it in an interview on, on, the, on the field, you know what I mean? Like, he said it on the internet on his own page. Like, I just don't understand how it is that um, that, that case can be made. Well, a lot of people uh, believe that uh, the sponsors, they would have strong-armed uh, Rugby Australia. And, of course, the, the chief uh, sponsor is uh, Qantas. The, the national team is called the Qantas Wallabies. And, if we, of course, we know how active Qantas CEO Alan Joyce was during the same-sex marriage uh, postal mm-hmm. survey campaign. And uh, f- we know that, uh, yeah, he... Uh, has been big on, you know, virtue signaling on that and other social justice Mm -hmm. issues. And so a lot of people are saying this has Alan Joyce's hands all over it. That's true. And this is, this is why I don't like money in all all these, all these sort of, um, you know, this money in sport, because it just ruins everything. I mean, when corporations get involved in, um, in, you know, sport, to the extent that they are anyway, it it really, it, it brings upon these kind of, um, you know, damaging um, conflicts here. And I, I really hate to see it. I mean, I really like to think that sport is sport, you know, that um, people, you know, can sit down and watch a match and not really, you know, have these sort of things in the background play out, you know. And it's really sad that this happens, but this happens because, you know, you have sponsors that are, you know, throwing lots and lots of money and they're basically, that means they're, they're controlling the show, you know. I mean, they're saying, oh, I don't like what that guy said, so you better fire him, otherwise we're not going to be giving you any money anymore. I mean, it, this is this is how, um, when, you're, when you're owned in the way that you are, I mean, you're very, you know, you've got your hands tied up behind your back here. And that, that, that's the sort of thing that I really hate seeing in sport. I mean, you've seen so much corruption, so much, you know... Um, it, and it's, you know, because there's so much money in it, you know, like it's it's not, you know, just a simple sort of game of sport, you know, it's just a money-making um, uh, scheme. And, I mean, I really hate seeing it. And this is the kind of stuff that, that happens when when, um, when money is in, in into it, yeah. yeah, well, sports bodies, uh, just on their own, especially the AFL, uh, uh, they embrace every single social justice cause uh, you can possibly think of. I mean, they, 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 the mm-hmm. AFL's got the, the multicultural round, the indigenous round, they've got their own pride uh, match, there's a women's round, they had a green round for a while, and then they're thinking of having a, a diversity ground, and Melbourne Football Club recently had a... Uh, a banner stating their opposition to online uh, trolls and yeah sport has become way too politicized or it, it well politicized to the left i should say Def- definitely yeah i mean and like i said I, I don't even think it should be politicized to the right i mean i don't expect uh teams to come out and say oh you know we um we know we support anti-immigration views and you know, this and that. i mean i i don't expect them to do that you know what i mean like i don't expect them I expect them to not really have any political opinions and just to be simply about sport. That's what I want, you know. I don't want them to, you know, push any sort of side. And um, the funny thing about Falau is that really what he stated is um, just typical Christian, um, you know, core belief. I mean, it might sound extreme, but that is Christian belief. It's also the belief of uh, most faiths, more or less, you know. I mean, they, they're all, you know... Religions um, have strict opinions on these topics, you know. I mean, and most of them would 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 follow that kind of code, you know. I mean, um, you don't have to like it, but at the same time, I mean, it's um, it represents over fifty percent of the population. So, I mean, you know, there's a huge following. It's more than um, you know the people on the list, which um, you know, like um, are only a minute percentage of the population you know but then again you know they're always trying to you know cater to you know your transgenders and you know all this which are only a minute population yet you know 
you don't you don't see them doing anything for the Christian population, which is only fifty percent of you know. Like, but, but that's why it is funny, like you mentioned, that it is skewed to the left, you know. But ideally, we just want sport to be sport, and we don't really want it to be you know politicised at all, you know, because this is the kind of stuff that happens. It's just ridiculous. Well, even though he was basically stating a biblical belief, a lot of people thought that the way he went about it was mean. And Scott Morrison, yeah, he's a, a Pentecostal. He called it uh, insensitive and, and disrespectful. And I can I can see the merit in that, that there's sort of like there, there's a more diplomatic way to go about it. I mean, nobody likes those street preachers who yell out, you know, you all need to repent or you're going to hell. Like the, the the town criers, like they don't win any friends. But that that's true. But I think on social media, like on a personal page, it's it's not as it's not um, to the same extent as in people's faces. You know what I mean? Like it's it's a big difference. Um, you know, obviously your personal page, people could choose to read it, not to read it. When you're confronting people in the street, you know, you don't they don't really have a choice. You know, <laughs> it's very confronting. Um, but, you know, like like I said, you know, he, he said something that was, you know, basic Christian teaching. I mean, you know, people don't have to agree with it, but this is this is the whole aspect of free speech here. I mean, can people say how they feel about any particular topic or um, are they going to be shut down and, you know, lose their employment or jobs because of it, which is, you know, not only in this case, but you, you see it in a lot of cases like with SSM and a lot of the, um, the other incidents where people, you know, lost jobs out of it because of their position against it. And um, it's very sad, you know, I mean, um, it would be an out absolute outcry if somebody was to uh, lose their position within an organisation because they were, um, you know, pro-LGBT. Like, it would be a an absolute scan scandalous thing all over the news. But because of this, I mean, you know, um, yeah, it's all over the news, but in, in a negative sort of portrayal, you know, I mean, people are saying, oh, yeah, you know, um, he shouldn't have had the right to have those views. He shouldn't have said what he said. Um, but then why is it that the sport then can push the other opposite side so hard, you know, with the pro, you know, transgenderism, the pro this, the pro that, you know, I mean, surely it's at the same level, you know, I mean, uh, a lot of people are offended when they, um, they hear all these sort of, um, you know, um, these, uh, progressive kind of, um, opinions, you know, in the sports, you know, people are offended by that. So if people are offended by that, yet nothing's done about that, um, and people are offended by what Falau said, and this is, you know, hit on the head here, I mean, there's obviously a big bias and a big agenda here, and that, that's the point. I mean, if people just um, allowed anybody to say whatever they wanted to, then we wouldn't have this, this issue, you know? But unfortunately, um, because there's bias there, it, it sort of makes free speech to be a laughing stock because, you know, some things are allowed to be said, some things aren't allowed to be said, depending on, you know, on the eye of the beholder here and there. And I mean, you know, just let people say what they want and then you're not going to have any problem. You know, I mean, you know, you get offended. Okay. You don't have to be friends with him on Facebook. I mean, you know, a lot of people wouldn't have even known about what he said unless it was publicized on the news. I mean, you know, one person saw it and made it a big story. Otherwise, most people um, that are friends with his that would have seen it, I'm sure would probably have the same views as he would. Um, so that's my position on it anyway. Oh, well, we'll see what the, the end result of this dispute is. It'll certainly have a, a big impact on uh, the relationship between employment and uh, free speech. We've, we've covered a lot tonight. It was a long show, Damien, but we didn't catch up uh, last week. Uh, so I think we're, we're up to speed and we certainly do aim to chat every week now uh, and go to air on a, a Monday night uh, so we can give our, our viewers a, a good wrap over what's happening in Australia and other parts of the world. Yeah, that would be great. I'm looking forward to it. And that's the show for today. As you're all aware, we're living in an age of social media censorship. Most recently, Australian Meditations, Reclaim Australia, and Canadian media personality Faith Goldie were banned from Facebook, while YouTuber Hunter Avalon had his account terminated for hate speech, but it was later restored after what YouTube called a error. 
For these reasons, we have established a presence on free speech social media. Gab is where we have a growing following. You can find us there at gab.ai slash the unshackled. And we are also on minds.com slash the underscore unshackled. There's also been a major conservative migration to MeWe. So we have a page over there, which is growing. It is mewe.com slash p slash the unshackled. And also with Tommy Robinson nearly gaining 30,000 subscribers to his Telegram channel. It has seen many people start their own channel and group chats over on the encrypted messaging app. The Unshackled has our own channel over there. It's been there for quite a while and we can be found at t.me slash the Unshackled. As the Unshackled continues to grow, it makes us a bigger target from our enemies. So it's important if you like our work and would like to keep us active and online, you support our work financially. You can pledge over at patreon.com slash the Unshackled or directly via paypal.me slash the Unshackled. We also have a premium membership option on our website, the Unshackled.net slash support options slash premium membership in case those two previous crowdfunding sources decide they don't like us anymore. As it is a Monday night, stay tuned. XYZ Live is happening on the Maddie Rose Live channel at 9.15pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. Until then, thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next show. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.